one second. I'm just trying to figure out, just trying to get everything all settled up. How are you guys doing today? Hopefully it's not too loud. Let me adjust these. Let me know how the quality is in the chat. I appreciate you guys. So like I said before, I am going to be doing the giveaway uh, results. I'm actually probably going to do them live just because it's a little bit easier so you guys can see exactly like the methodology. I'll just like a random number generator and I have all of your guys' names for each section of like what tool you guys wanted. And I'm going to do that like live so you guys can see it. So there's no like hanky panky going on. Like everybody who uh, entered has equal chance to win. A lot of you guys really wanted certain tools. So the competition for that is going to be a lot higher, but for other tools that no one really wanted, maybe towards the end of the video, if they didn't really see it, uh, there's like zero competition for it. So we'll see uh, how that goes. Let me know what you guys think. Uh, hit me up in the comments. Hit me up uh, in the live chat. Let me know if you guys have any questions. I kind of want to wait a couple minutes before I get started into the actual giveaway because I want to give people an opportunity. So let me know what you guys think. Uh, how are you guys doing today? just going to settle this right here. Um, currently right now I am working on a night shift. So it gives me a lot more opportunities to do a lot more live streams, a lot more content. If you guys have seen, I've been posting a lot more videos lately just because it's a lot easier. So hoping to keep this momentum going forward. I just want to know like, what are you guys thinking? How can I like improve my videos? How can I give you things that you want to see opposed to just like random content, uh, things that are popping in my mind. I kind of want to, you know, tailor my stuff towards my audience. I know that it is still fairly small, but I also want to give you guys an opportunity to interact with me, ask questions. The difficult part about my job right now, which is the fact that, you know, because I work for a bigger, you know, construction company, I don't have the opportunity to just like strap on a GoPro and to show you, you know, second by second throughout my day because again with a bigger job there's so much more liabilities there's so much more uh actions that can happen that can you know get myself in trouble or other companies so like they don't allow us to film inside of the actual job site so it makes it more difficult for me to give you a day in the life you know perspective but i try to on my breaks film stuff use my drone to kind of give a perspective that like a public could see so try to you know balance that out um hopefully you guys can appreciate that so um, now we got a couple of people in here. Let's talk about uh, how we are going to do the actual giveaway. Like I said, I'm going to have a random number generator. I have all of your guys' numbers um, already listed on here. That's not good. Well, dang. Uh, okay. Okay, so I have, uh, let me just pull this up and Google real quick for you guys. I'll share my screen right here. Uh, so this is going to be for the first item right here. Like I said before, this is the canvas bolt bag. We had uh, 12 uh, contestants. And so we are going to do the drawing right here. It's one through 12. Hold on one second. Let me refresh this. Okay. Here we go right here. Let's go. Number two. And number two is Alex22 was the winner of the bolt bag. Now let's do a drawing for the... five and one and for that we had uh five people so let's change this to five and number one got that so that's going to be user 50 
user fifteen ninety five. And for the last item, we only had two contestants, and that was for the hammer holder, the um, the bullpen, and the uh, tape measure. And the winner is going to be Billy. So that's who the winners are for this contest. This contest is going to be Alex twenty two. It's going to be user uh, fifteen ninety five and Billy. I think it's kind of weird that all the numbers kind of landed on one. Let me just try this out and see if it stays the same because it's a little bit weird. Yeah, it was a little bit janky before, so hopefully you guys forgive me. Like, if we if you think it looks weird, let me know in the chat. Oh, Snapchat at work. Well, that's just uh, pretty simple. Um, I just wanted to do that right there, just so everybody can see it live. Um, I know people are probably at work right now, but like I said before, I do have to um, do this stuff while I am here. So let's just go forward with another topic. So let's go forward in the topic. Let's talk about um, some of the things that I'm seeing as far as labor uh, shortages and whatnot. I've been reading a couple articles and I think they've been kind of interesting. I want to read these to you guys, see guys what you guys think. So this is talking about, uh, this is an NPR article. Now NPR is, you know, going to be more biased, but I think when it's on non-political topics, I think that NPR and other news organizations are fairly good when it comes to uh, information that's not going to have a much of a political slant. So when it talks about uh, construction or the lack of workers, I think they're a good news source. The problem is right now when it comes to media is just that everybody has their own biases. Everybody has their audience they're catering to. And so it makes it difficult to sparse information out. That's why I try to read from all sources. But when it comes to topics that aren't going to be so like, um, I want to say politically driven or not going to be so highly contested, I think they are good news sources. So, and again, they have a, a lot of journalists, they have a lot of research teams, editors. So I think it's a, a better source than your random YouTuber who's just speaking out of his ass. So I kind of want to talk about what, what they're seeing in this article and also get my perspective on what I'm seeing currently. So it says this, where do the workers go? Construction jobs are plentiful, but workers are scarce. And I definitely think, you know, seeing that uh, right now on my job site, we have the manpower people that are having a really hard time finding guys who are actually in the apprenticeship already that are actually, you know, trained to go because the apprenticeship is kind of a bottleneck, right? We only have so many spots for guys. And if guys aren't, you know, connecting with their with their general contractors, they don't have a job, they don't want to open up the floodgates and allow like, you know, 20,000 more apprentices if they don't have jobs for the guys. So it's kind of a disconnect of people finding people for the jobs. Like some contractors only want like more experienced uh, apprentices, maybe like a third or fourth term. They don't really want to sit back and like babysit like a first term or someone who's really, really new. So we kind of find that balance of getting guys a chance in the trades, but also trying to find houses for guys that are already in there. So it talks about how when President Biden, when President Biden linked that uh, one trillion dollar deal, giving the roads, bridges, and transit uh, systems a boost, union officials and business leaders said a large scale investment infrastructure was long overdue, and that's definitely true, especially like in the major cities. I don't know how you guys feel, but living in Portland, we need a lot more infrastructure uh, for our roads. Just like the fact that everything's so con congested, I think we need to have something where either we expand the roads or maybe double decker them have them maybe have a high speed like express from portland all the way to vancouver because the traffic is just so bad and the congestion is so bad that it makes it very hard to want to commute especially to uh the inner cities where a lot of the jobs are you're going to be spending an hour hour and a half in traffic depending on where you live if you live in gresham 
or if you live like really far from the city and you have to go to the other side of the city, that's a huge time investment. You're spending every single day of your life. So it could be an hour to two hours every day. So that's something to think about when you are coming getting the trades is your job is going to move around a lot, but a lot of times you're going to be traveling. It's not going to be, you know, right down the street where you can like buy a house centrally and then be able to go there every day. It's going to be something that's going to constantly be changing. You might only be at a job site for a month, two months and it's switching up. And then, so it's hard to build a routine, but at the same time, it is exciting because you are moving around a lot too. So it talks about with infrastructure, I'm seeing a lot more like bridges being built. We're seeing a lot more, um, a lot more investment in our infrastructure as far as our roads. I'm definitely seeing that just not in, the freeway where a lot of the, you know, it's affecting our commute. We're not really seeing it there though. So it says, where have all the good, where have all the workers gone? The construction industry hires, uh, faces a dire labor shortage. The number of construction openings jumped to 129,000 in February while hiring was only, while hiring decreased by 18,000, according to labor, uh, labor department Tuesday. That stands in contrast to the overall job market where job openings dipped to 9.9 .9 million in February down to 632,000 from January. Even with more money to repair roads, building new bridges, worker shortage loom over the industry already strapped for people. And with fewer people, projects could take longer to complete, becoming more expensive drag on. And that's true too, because there is a error when it comes to construction, like as far as, you know, the, the caliber of people who do it. And the fact that for so long, we've been told that being in construction is like a lower like level job. Like you don't have the same dignity as other people. Like your job title doesn't matter as much. You're not, people don't want to do it. Right. So when supply and demand comes into effect, people who are doing it are getting paid more and more. They say like, you know, If you look at a lot of the jobs that have had a constant wage increase, it's been in construction. It's been on. It's been a lot of those fields that have been more hands on, just because people don't want to do it. People don't want to do it, and therefore it makes the job uh, be a lot more like um, a lot more lucrative if you do take that field, right? Like the oil fields. Uh, being like a, a Alaska fisherman construction stuff that like you can break your body down, but also like, you know, you can break your body down, but you are exchanging, you know, the fact that you are using your body a lot more for a higher wage. Let me see something real quick. Let me just make sure. Okay. Okay. Let's get back to what I was saying. Yeah, so because because the demand is, you know, the demand is so much higher for the trades now because nobody wants to do it just because of a social aspect. Like if you look at it, if you say engineer is a good job or working at a certain like top five, you know, Fortune 500 company because of the prestige, is the prestige coming from the money? Because in the trades, we're getting paid just as much as them now. It's just you're going to be dirty. Uh, you're going to be working long hours. A lot of times you're working on weekends, but you're not salary. A lot of these guys who work in these fortune 500 companies, they're working on a salary. So their, uh, wages are locked in. So if they have to do more overtime, they have to have more of a crunch schedule. Their pay doesn't increase for us. If we have like overtime, anything after eight hours is automatically time and a half. It doesn't matter if you only work one day that week. Um, a lot of times Saturdays are time and a half automatically no matter what you work and on a sunday it's double time so if you're feeling that pressure from your company to make you work longer hours you're going to get that incentive by being paid more and so you don't really see that when it comes to other jobs and i think that's one of the main like uh i think drivers to see people maybe switch these jobs like if you're going to get burnt out you might as well be getting paid well for it right so so i'm kind of confused on when people talk about how like certain fields are you know, have a higher like prestige with them or like a higher status associated to them. If we get paid the same amount of money, what's the difference, right? Like a lot of people don't understand computers. A lot of people understand like construction. So I, you would think that the level of expertise that you have and the fact that you are able to take some of those skills you learn into like your normal everyday life, I think that they'd be a lot more uh, prestigious, especially when people when people really need the trades, especially when it comes to, you know, roofing and things falling apart, you definitely want to see, uh, you know, someone who knows they're doing at your house to help you repair the stuff. So you would think that 
uh, jobs to actually do things, to actually get things accomplished in a tangible world, we'll get a lot more appreciation, but we're really not seeing that right now. So it says the number of people applying for construction jobs fell online fell about 40% from 2019 to 2020 and then fell flat ever since, according to Julia Pollock of the Economic for Zip Recruiter. Pollock said the, the surprising partially because for many people, the pandemic savings had run out and the insurance for work eligibility uh, visas for the overall job market has recovered, but the pandemic slowed down. Plus, Pollock said the uh, pandemic allowed workers to migrate out of out of jobs that require them to be on site into remote work, which often provides greater flexibility. That's true. And I think that's not going to change. You cannot really do uh, construction work from home. So that's one of the more difficult aspects. If you want to be in your pajamas doing a job, the trades definitely aren't going to be for you. You have to be there on time. Not only are you not going to be inside of an office space, but you're also going to be like outside in the, in the elements. It's going to be cold. You're going to be miserable. But I think after a while, you kind of get used to it. So I think you have that trade off because, again, the tougher this job is, the more people keep, you know, uh, snubbing their nose to an acting as if like it's a piece of shit job, the more money we're going to make. And so we're seeing that more and more, and especially when it comes to people really viewing this uh, occupation and this career as something that is like less than we're just seeing that money go up more and more and more. So it says the pipeline problem, while the infrastructure bill set aside money on a large scale for public works projects, it doesn't directly set aside anything for training the people to do them. I haven't used a dime of federal funding, says uh, Sean Ray, a vice president of overseeing training at a Arizona based uh, Sunnet Construction. Sunnet, a large scale contractor, bankrolls construction training programs at a handful of local community colleges. Many of those students can be hired by Sunnet after they graduate. And Ray said he meets with the state officials uh, last year, discussed getting some of that federal funding money set aside for them. And that's true too. Um, like I said before, we do have a bottleneck as far as like the apprenticeship programs because a lot of people are not coming with any skills at all. Like we you know we removed a lot of shop class, we removed a lot of like uh, uh, welding certificates you might get in high school. So people are coming in brand new, and so that means we have to train them all the way from you know the bottom all the way up. We don't have that many facilities like the one main we have two in Oregon and they're not very big. So we can only house a couple thousand apprentices at a time. So say that the government said we want to just build, you know, 30,000 houses in the next two years. We don't have enough or I don't know if that's a big number or not, but let's say we wanted to build a million houses and, you know, affordable housing within like Washington, Oregon. We don't have the infrastructure to train guys that are gonna be able to do these jobs properly. And so I think that when money comes forward towards a project, it's good, but if there is nobody to actually train the people up, because again, people are retiring right now that have all the knowledge so frequently that it makes it very difficult for new guys to really learn. I've seen a lot of apprentices teaching apprentices. We might have like, three or four journeyman on a job. We might have like six apprentices. So sometimes the journeyman can't like explain everything. So you're having guys who are third terms teaching first terms. And so obviously it's a good, pro a good process, but it would be nice to have more like seasoned veterans, more like training, like as far as like pre-apprenticeship classes so that people kind of have more of an idea what they're doing before just getting sending out to the wolves like I was. And so it says, there's funding, but is it being spent in the right ways? Just 57 out of the 144 funding grants within Biden's administration trillion dollar infrastructure bill were eligible to be used for workforce related efforts, according to the tracker by the National Governors Association, Association by NPR. Hey, what's up? Hey, what's up, Greg? Just talking about normal stuff, bro. Just talking about the unions. Just wanted to know to enter the giveaway. Just wanted you to know how to enter the giveaway. Oh, man. Sorry, bro. It's already over. Uh, that was for the last video. I just wanted to do it live to show you guys, you know, that so everybody could see it. But, yeah, that's that's done. Okay, so back to this. So finding enough workers is going to become even greater challenge for construction industry in the coming years as older workers retire faster than younger workers can take their places, according to Ken Simonson, uh, 
chief economic of the Associate General Contractors of America. The trillion dollar infrastructure bill gives much needed funding to big projects, he said, but now the burden falls already on stretch unions and construction firms to find workers in a tight hiring pool. And again, when you have that bottleneck of the training, it makes it harder for you to find guys. So I see a lot of companies turn down work where, you know, they would want to have the ability, but if you've been on a job set where you have a lot of people that are really green, it's it's difficult because you don't have that intuitive sense to know like, okay, this guy is going to do this, and I know he's going to jump onto this next project. I know that I can leave him here, and he's going to be safe. He's not going to injure himself. And so you don't want to have a ton of like really, really green people working at the same time. So if we do not you know, increase the uh, infrastructure for training, it's going to be a lot harder on these jobs because – when it comes to like the safety, when it comes to just like overall, like knowing what to do on a job site, it's all about the training. It's all about, you know, the protocols and that takes time and effort. And so we need to not just put money in towards the projects themselves, but also put money towards the back end to invest in the next generation. As these guys retire more and more, we're going to definitely see that deficit of guys. And then if it keeps going the way it's going, you're going to see carpenters making $150,000, electricians making $200,000, you know, you building a house and it costing you, you know, $500,000 because the labor is going to become so expensive that, you know, it's going to be really difficult. And obviously these are not jobs that are, you know, sought after just because of the, the, I like to be outside and be really active. It's also because you, it pays well. So we're going to find that balance. And I think we definitely have to invest on the back end so that if we do have more money invested towards these projects, as far as like affordable housing or renovating some of these older buildings into different kinds of spaces that we have an, a workforce that is going to be able to do it not only um, quickly, but safely. We're not, so we're not endangering people and uh, making people like, you know, unsafe by sending too many green guys out at the same time. It says, uh, for Nathan Berry, the Dean of Career and Technical Education at the Metropolitan Community College of Omaha, Nebraska, planning to expand construction training opportunities began about a de decade ago. We had so many people ready to retire, and we didn't have a good pipeline of people coming in. The school opened a construction education center in 2017, where teachers building, welding, and other trades, but now the wait list to join these trade uh, programs are long, and Berry said the meaning that means that adding more classes at night, recruiting workers to teach part time in order to offer any types of hand on training, there are really three components you need. You need the actual space. You need the equipment that replicates industries, which can be expensive. And you need instructors that actually know how to teach that stuff. And I think that's definitely true. Like now people are starting to get more online. Like I'm seeing my channel, people are asking like, how do I get involved? And then they're going out and they're contacting their local and they're like, well, how do I get into the apprenticeship? And like, well, it doesn't open up until this time. And so guys kind of like leave. So, I mean, we really have to capitalize on the market right now where we have a, a, a greater interest in it, because if we do not, we're going to see things get at a, I mean, astronomically expensive if we don't have a workforce to work these jobs. And again, it's kind of one of those things where it's like, when is the best time to build a tree? And that's like 30 years ago. And the second best time is to do it now. And so we definitely have to start investing in, you know, the future, even though a lot of times that, you know, we've, there's been an emphasis on like STEM, uh, engineering, techno technology and math. We definitely have to start focusing on some of the things that are more like tangible, more like textile, handcrafted things. We have to start putting some money towards that and education. And it also takes guys that are actually in the trades reaching back and then, you know, going online and kind of exposing what's going on. Obviously, you know, like I said before, it is difficult for me to show exactly what I'm doing every day. But I do think that go making YouTube channels, talking about the process, kind of like, you know, demystifying the whole uh segment of this economy i think it's definitely going to help younger people i think will be more, gravitate towards the trades more if we show them what's going on and eliminate some of the bs that goes on on the other side too so it says who's going to go teach high school class for fifty thousand dollars when they can make eighty five to hundred thousand dollars in the trades 
Support for woodshop and metal class offerings in high school disappeared in the early 2000s to make way for uh, computer labs, Ray said, and still convincing people to take up construction, very physical demanding jobs over a job as a server in a restaurant or supermarket cashier where wages have been rising is challenging. That's the thing. We're not doing a very good job with. We've got to find a way to make construction sexy. Again, too, if if construction is considered a low status job and people aren't looking at us a way to like really have a career, then again, it's going to be difficult. But I do understand what they're saying too. Like when it comes to schooling, like if you're talking about uh, like a shop class or a welding class, why would I, um, why would I do that when I could be in the field? And so I think more like a lot of the older guys, maybe that can't do the same things with their body anymore. will transition more into the teaching. I think that's probably a better look anyway. When I've been in class and I've talked to instructors who have been in the trades for maybe five or six years and they transition to teaching people kind of side eye my side eye them a little bit because they're like, well, have you even really been in the flames yet? Have you really even gone through like the whole process of being a proper carpenter if you haven't really done this for multiple years? So it's kind of incumbent on the guys who maybe have their body a little bit, but still have their mind to go back and teach. And that's like an investment that is going to, you know, pay dividends later on. And I think that's something we're, we're not really seeing with the the me, me, me culture so much where people are only kind of looking out for themselves. We're not really seeing people plant trees for the next generation. And I don't know if that's just like a, a boomer thing or like a millennial thing where people just really don't care about the society as a whole. They're kind of really just looking out for themselves more like just like greed and just look out for me. It's hard when like, you know, as a society, we all come together and do certain things. And if people just only look out for themselves, it makes it very hard for us to have something cohesive. That makes sense. So it says charging to find new recruits. And there are other restrictions uh, in the president's infrastructure bill. In many cases, a project that receives funding needs to fill a quota of minorities and women workers, which is difficult to do in an industry that has been traditionally dominated by white people, by white men. That's a fact. That's a fact. Um, I've been on multiple jobs where we will do a low income housing job and they need a certain amount of minority owned businesses to apply for uh, the job for their bids. And um, that's sometimes that's a, that's a good thing, obviously, because if we continue with the way things were, we'd only have, you know, a certain like demographic of people. But when you open things up and you make like criteria, it kind of makes things a little more difficult, especially if there's not a lot of I say there's not a lot of black electrical companies and you need a lot more like minorities, like black people, women. If you can't find that, then a lot of these jobs really get bogged down and you're not able to find the best. Right. And so also we have to kind of start transitioning guys that are competent carpenters, are competent electricians to start their own company so they can then start, you know, uh, giving back and also getting some of these jobs, right? Like if you are a good carpenter and you're a badass, you start your own company so we can have more opportunities to fill these roles where, you know, if you're a woman and you've gone through your apprenticeship and you feel competent, like start bidding smaller jobs, getting more business owners, I think it's a good thing. I think it'll keep things more competitive too. So if you're a scrappy startup, you're able to compete and take a little bit more of the jobs from the bigger companies. It also keeps them honest. And so I think that's really, uh, when we really shine is when everybody is coming together, everybody's playing their role and keeping, you know, the big guys honest. I think we have to do that too, but I've been on jobs where, you know, we have to hire certain min minorities and some of the companies don't do a great job. And then what do you do? So it's a balance where it's like, just because you are a minority doesn't mean you're going to be the best worker, but also doesn't mean you're going to be the worst. And so I think just giving uh, more people opportunities opposed to just giving them jobs just because of a certain like uh, phenotype, I think it's definitely the balance we're going to have to strike moving forward. And so it says, um, Ray says that it can be frustrating for companies that have 7% of its workforce is women. And it's almost as if we're putting up barriers to ourselves, but to others, the target funding is to bring underrepresented groups into construction is long overdue. Historically, you know, not a person of color in the industry. It's not a woman industry said a Jeanette, uh, a field agent for the local 737, uh, a branch of the laborers international union for uh, North America based in Portland, Oregon. 
Volantis 44 helps represent fellow union members in disagreements with contractors, but started uh, her decade long career in construction laborers throughout their apprenticeship readiness program with a nonprofit for Oregon tradeswomen in 2011. I was a single mom with three children and I was living with my parents in a spare bedroom on a bunk bed. I need to make a change. And Greg brings up a great, a great point too. Like sometimes just uh, getting a bid, you know, um, requirement doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get more of those people in the trades. I'm going to be honest with you. I am probably the only black person that's, you know, ever on my job site for the most part, you might see a few like black electricians, but it's very rare. You'll ever see like uh, black iron workers and black carpenters pretty much. And so making, uh, it easier for black people to get in is good, but also if they don't want to do the job, that's not going to help anything, right? Like, I don't know what else you can really do. And then if you start scraping the barrel and like, just like trying to beg people to come in, you're not going to get like the cream of the crop or the guys who are really going to bust their ass. And so I think to find a balance too, if people don't want to do it, what do you do with that? Like, I think maybe, maybe, uh, asking, giving like, a incentivizing it but then having a time limit right or like having like some kind of situation where you can find a trade-off where if no minorities want to come or no women want to come then it just open open season again because you find you find the balance of if you leave it only to the market it, it's going to be just full of nepotism where it's going to be like the boss's son the boss's nephew the cousin his friend and then that just dominated the market where outsiders can never get in but if you make it so focused on like we need three blacks two women one hispanic three gay people it's like well if you can't find that quota then these jobs don't get completed so again we have to find a balance somewhere in between where we can find a happy medium and i think we're going to find that over time that some of these systems we're, we're building right now don't work and i think we're going to find if we continue on the way we're doing it it just slogs things down a lot especially in portland there's so much red tape when it comes to building like we'll have uh, a uh, environmental like um, investigator come to our jobs and see like, hey, there's dirt from your job site in the street and then find our company. But then there'll be a homeless person like burning like tires right next to the job site. And so it's like, what's going on right now? It's like we're ha we have like a, a baby Mad Max situation right here, but then we're trying to build, you know, affordable housing and you're constantly on our ass. You're constantly having like OSHA being called. You're constantly having like people harassing the companies because we're working too early in the morning. Uh, people want their beauty sleep. So I think again, there's just trade-offs that like we have to uh, think about before we just kind of constantly keep complaining about like why things aren't going like adequately for everybody, if that makes sense. QP Lore says it has to start in high school, even making it a prerequisite credit to graduate in ninth grade or 10th grade early exposure. I mean, that makes sense. I think there are certain things that, you know, you're required to do a certain level of math, even if you're not going to have to do it uh, outside of your um, degrees. I think a certain level of exposure is good to see people swing a hammer. If you can't swing a hammer as a man or even as a woman, if you can't, you know, uh, put a... Um, a doorknob on or if you don't know how to fix you know um just basic stuff at your house it makes it so that the cost seems so much more expensive so if we if we had like a little bit more exposure a little bit more chances to see how things work i think a lot of people will be interested into it so i think to find a balance like i think with ai coming and it taking a lot of these like lower level like uh engineering jobs coding jobs i think we're definitely going to see a renaissance in the trades and so i think we have to be there to have the infrastructure in high schools having people uh, uh be able to use saws use impacts just so they have a familiarity with it so that they're not so afraid because a lot of people are afraid of things they've never been involved in whether it be minorities women you know a lot of people say like, hey i want you in, i want you in this career but i'd never even heard about being a carpenter as a kid, you know what I mean? So I definitely think that's huge too. That exposure, I think is definitely gonna be key. It says funding from the 2009 Obama era infrastructure had gotten a steam, uh, a stream of bridges and rail projects on the road. 
and created a similar demand for labor, she said. A few years later, she was able to purchase a home and she credits that with the program aiming at recruiting more women in construction. This just levels a playing field for everyone because we're looking at these communities that have been historically disadvantaged. Like I said, um, for me too, like uh, obviously I, I don't know for a fact I got preferential treatment getting into my union, but I did do the Job Corps program. And so that makes you automatic entry. So that's one thing. And also just like showing up, like I think people come that actually want to be a part of the trades and actually want to be enthusiastic about it. And it's not just something where like, hey, I'm a felon or hey, I'm a drug addict. So it's the only thing I can do. People that actually want to do this job and actually take like pride in their work, I think will get you a lot further than just being like a minority group or a, a box checking thing. Because again, even if you do get in with ticking some kind of box, if you don't do a good job, you're not going to stay long. It doesn't matter like, you know, hey, you know, uh, this person's black, so, you know, you can't fire them. Things do get tricky a little bit, but I'm going to be honest with you. Like, if you don't do a good job, you will be laid off. Whether, you know, people have to face the scrutiny of like f firing a black person or not, you're not going to keep a job because you're black. I don't think that your skin color, your sexuality or gender should just like automatically get you a job and you should keep it just because of those box checking. So you're definitely going to have a hard time if you have that mindset, to be honest with you. Greg says, I think the problem with the trades being looked down on is parents are teaching these kids. Parents aren't teaching these kids. Aren't teaching parents. Part of the trades looking down on is parents are teaching their kids skills. Every eight years should know how to hold a flashlight for their dad. Okay, there we go. There we go. Yeah. And I think, too, in certain communities where if you don't have anybody in the trades already and you don't have any kind of – um initial like insight on it it's going to be hard like right you know so i think having parents in the household and teaching their sons the things they're learning i think it's definitely beneficial i teach my sons how to use you know the screwdrivers i had them with me with projects even if they're just watching i think just seeing them you know every day me going to work me coming back being filthy i think that exposure i think it definitely is good and i think some communities don't get that initial exposure so they kind of think well why would I ever venture into something that I've never seen somebody else do? It takes a, a brave soul to jump into a trade or occupation that they've never seen anybody else do that. You know, they're just going to trailblaze and say, just jump out of the, the, the airplane with no parachute type situation. So let me share. Let me share this other article right here. Okay, so it says, talking about replenishing uh, the construction labor shortfalls. Several factors have led to the labor industry's pundits calling the great, the great resignation and mass migration of labor uh, forces out of the work jobs as the Atlantic staff, uh, Derek Thompson wrote, quits the Bureau of Labor Statistics call them are rising almost every industry, blame pandemic malaise, a government aid funded lifting the enabled millions the time and motivated to reevaluate career options the bamboo were seizing the day and retiring and the u.s economy fields its enormous labor shortfalls also i'm not going to lie to you there's like an underbelly that goes on when it comes to construction that i've seen that i kind of want to talk about it's a lot of people hiring illegal immigrants to do jobs that makes certain jobs almost like not it makes it very hard to make a living doing them especially when it comes to non-union jobs and i think that most guys wouldn't care about people hiring illegal immigrants if they just paid them fairly if they paired them a, a wage that's comparable to us if you are competing with people who are like starving who are like indentured servant are like pretty much indentured servants to like a coyote or someone who brought them to america now they can just pay them scraps and so they can really just depress the wages for that field it's going to be very hard to get guys to come in and actually want to do the job because again 
the only reason why people really want to do these jobs, period, because they pay, you know, fairly well. And, you know, you get the sense of working with your hands. But if these jobs pay ass, like if these jobs are paying $17 an hour and you make the same amount of money working at McDonald's, you're never going to choose this. Especially when it comes to the fact that you can get injured on the job. It's a lot more labor intensive. The commuting is a lot longer. There's so much more that goes into it as far as like your body, like, you know, bruises and just like breaking down of like certain limbs and stuff. Like if you have a choice of working at McDonald's for the same wage, why would you ever do the trades? And so I think definitely speaking on that aspect of stopping people from hiring illegal, illegal immigrants for like poverty wages, I think was definitely going to make a big impact. I, I, if you are someone who migrates this country and you come from a tough situation, I don't blame you. I would do it too. I mean, if I lived in Mexico and I've seen how they live and how tough it is, I would try to come here too and, and get a job and provide for my family. I just think that they should be paid properly and be taught properly. And then, you know, also in an ideal world, come here legally. But if they're not, they should they shouldn't be like put in a situation where like they're they're like a permanent underclass where you don't see them. Uh, they're they're getting paid like poverty wages. They're living, you know, twelve people to like a one bedroom apartment, and so that's how they can survive. I think that's kind of gross, and I think that is kind of like a form of like modern day slavery. So I do think if we can mitigate that, if we can stop employers from taking advantage of people and actually paying them a a, a a wage that is comparable to what the um, what the trades are. I think we'd see a lot more fair like immigration in this country, and you wouldn't see a lot so many people being so opposed to illegal immigration, right? Because if you live in Texas and your skill set is like framing, and obviously there is some intricacies to it, but a lot of it's just like you know, sixteen on center, pound pound, go go go. If you have guys who can't speak a lick of English and they're coming and they're depressing your wages. You're, you're going to have some animosity towards these guys and not because of who they are, just the fact that they're just taking jobs from you. And this happens throughout history. Anytime you have a native uh, worker base and people are coming to those jobs, oh, those areas, and wanting to do your job for less, there's going to be animosity. So I think if we could find some way to bring the illegal immigrants' wages up and then help them you know, become actual citizens, I think we wouldn't see so much dysfunction in Texas, Arizona, Nevada, but really, really, it's really incumbent on these companies not being able to skirt the law and paying these guys like poverty wages. I ended up behind in the stream, but saying a good portion estimate can be done remotely. Still want to visit sites for anything not obvious from the plans and maps surveyors. Yeah, I think I think there are portions of construction that definitely could be um, done remotely or done with like drone work. I know a lot of times we're on so many different jobs where we'll stop everything, like where our foreman will leave, our superintendent, our project manager, and they'll like walk the job site, which easily can be done by somebody wearing like a 360 uh, camera, walking the site, and they can review that from their house. And so I think we can definitely do that, use more drones, use the technology at hand that we have so that we're not like clogging the system and stopping everything. And again, when you have stuff like on video, it's much easier to go back and look, you know, and actually see what's going on at the job. So I think utilizing that technology is important, but I've seen some companies frown upon that because if they catch something that maybe they did wrong, maybe like um, they didn't install a pipe correctly. Now, like there's like insurance implications, there's like quality implications. So people are kind of shying away from that. But the way to mitigate that is just do your job properly. If you're doing your job properly, it shouldn't matter. Like if you get photographed every single day, every single moment, if you're doing your job adequately, then you shouldn't have to worry about people seeing your work afterwards, if that makes sense. And so I definitely think that some estimations, uh, some like engineer to RFI, giving them a, a real thorough look at something, I think is definitely going to be able to be accessed with technology. I remember the military coming to talk to us in school and to use interest in the uh, reserve forces. The union evolving with the skilled trades should be doing the same with the UBC and the IBW, for example. Uh, 
Yeah. And I also think that it can't just be a thing where you come to one school one time and then you did your job and now you're gone too, right? Like it has to be like over time, building relationships, showing people that this is like a, a, a proper way to live, right? And that's why I kind of like I do show some things on my channel that don't necessarily involve construction per se. When I talk about going to Mexico or showing that I go to concerts and that kind of thing, like it's not your whole life is not going to revolve around construction, but construction definitely can be a like economic driver to allow you to do other things. Like right now, I started my YouTube channel. I'm able to do that because I make good money in the trades, right? Like this channel can be something completely different than what I do on my job. I only do that because this is what I know and I can talk about. It. I feel uncomfortable talking about stuff that I have no idea about. But given the ability to, you know, go hunting on the weekends, uh, go shoot guns, go buy shoes you like, go on vacation, uh, travel, um, just whatever you want to do, having the trades be the economic fuel for that, I think is definitely a, a good a good way to advocate towards it instead of just saying like, listen, join the trades and you can, you know work with your hands and it's it's a good career once every you know once a year i think showing a different side of the trades like you see how it is you see the camaraderie i think that's huge too is so many people are running towards jobs where they are making themselves isolated they're making themselves where they don't ever have any social interaction i think the trades are great because you have to talk to people you have to see them in their face you have to look at them you have to have conflict resolution you have to actually practice what you preach you actually have to do the work especially for guys who are foremen that are still in the field it's nice to talk to guys and banter in the lunchroom i think so many people are moving towards things that are just so much easier but again we're lacking that humanity like what is the point of making an extra ten thousand dollars and you never see anybody, you don't talk to anybody, you have no friends, and then now you're on like antidepressants and now you're depressed at your house. I think that's definitely a trade-off we're definitely gonna see with when it comes to trades is if you're a man, especially young men, and you are you don't have any friends, you don't know where to find anybody to talk to, joining a trade is gonna be big because you're gonna have that camaraderie, you're gonna have those tough times you're going to overcome things you're going to have that rite of passage where you go through your whole apprenticeship and then you finish in your journeyman i think those things are huge and i think they definitely are things that aren't really they aren't really spoken about enough but i definitely think that these can definitely be things you can advocate for and not just the money aspect there's so much more to your life than just the money like but also money is still important too he said, for sure, 100%, I still get beers with the guys from classes I've taken. You make friends for life, and they show up whenever you need them. True. True, 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 true. And I think if you're a person who feels like, you know, they're depressed, they don't have any friends, they're not they're not able to, you know, find those connections, one way to fix that is to be the person reaching out, like asking guys to go out for, for drinks, um, inviting people out to for their birthdays be that person who's taking the extra step if you feel like you're missing something give more to others and you're definitely going to see that come back uh, as a reciprocity let's go back to article real quick <clears throat> it says in almost no other industry is the gap between available workers and opportunities more pronounced than that of the infrastructure, given the infrastructure's investment with the JOBS Act, the infrastructure construction industry is about to experience a surge in resources, but the talent shortfall threatens the infrastructure's ability to take advantage of this once in a generation opportunity. And that's something too, like you'll hear guys talk about like what's not fair, like what what guys, what generations got that we didn't get, like you got to buy a house and you know, you got the GI Bill. Well, there's certain things that are going on right now that are not necessarily the equivalent of it, but they are definitely close to that. People are going to look back like 20 years ago, like, I wish I could have gotten the trades when it wasn't a lot of competition. I wish I could have gotten the trades when, you know, they were really investing in infrastructure. We're trying to build a lot more housing. We're going to have a lot of this what it could have, should have mentalities 20 years from now that people are going to look at like, man, why didn't I take advantage of that situation when it was there? Especially with things that have to be done. Like, Getting in right now, 
you're going to see a lot more guys get into leadership a lot faster, get into the foreman job, get into a position where like, you don't have to be in the field anymore too. Like, so say if you're a guy that like doesn't want to do the trades because like you don't want to be messy or dirty, there's opportunities for like leadership roles. There's opportunities in, in construction where you don't necessarily have to break your body for your whole entire career. Very few guys stay out in the field for their whole career. Most guys get a certain level of expertise that they move up into management levels. They, you know, they parlay those skills into different job offerings. So just know that if you get into construction, you're not going to be stuck being a grunt carrying two bys on your shoulders your whole career, unless you want to. I mean, some guys they don't want to go higher up, but I think definitely knowing that there's so much more opportunities right now than ever before, because especially the people who are leaving right now are the higher up guys are the season guys you want to get in now while you can still get some of that knowledge they have get some of those tricks they have because you don't want to get into a field where nobody has the expertise anymore no one has that like long track record of doing things properly and then now you're getting taught by them maybe the wrong way or maybe just like the blind leading the blind type situation where you know you have guys who are just journeyed out teaching you things and they don't really have that track record of experience of doing multiple things it's not that these guys don't know what they're doing per se it's just construction is so vast it doesn't matter what what you've done so far in your apprenticeship it's just there's so many things you can do that you could be a master at one thing and then be a complete novice at something else and so having a having a record of being in the trades for you know 20 25 30 years you can pull a lot more, you know, experience from that well that you have, the of uh, things that you made, mis mistakes that you made, uh, seeing things before they happen, having that experience thing is definitely going to be key too. So it says to compete with other industries, attract a new generation of talent to maximize the output of the current workforce. There's a strong case for the industry to consider advanced digital technologies. Not only do solutions improve efficiencies and collaborations, but they also appeal to a younger tech savvy generation who expect to be equipped with these tools. And I mean, making this one corny, like, uh, talk about Fortnite, you know, Fortnite, the kids are building stuff there. I don't know. I, it, to me, it just seems like there is a disconnect between what the real world is and how it's perceived online. And I definitely do think that a lot of the biggest, maybe when you see people online and they are advocating for the trades, there's definitely a certain level of like, oh, this guy looks like he's gross. Uh, he doesn't take care of himself. Like he's he has a whole bunch of beer cans like in his truck you know what i'm saying so i definitely think there's that but i don't think just like hey come 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 to this job fair and we'll give you a a, a fortnight skin it's definitely going to change things either i think there's a balance where you're not gonna say hey hip young kids come to the trades and and you can swing a big hammer like in the video games that's not gonna work either so we gotta find a balance i think Yeah, and Derek said too, like superintendents. Like I think there's going to be chances for. Um, I've seen I've seen people in my career where I started my apprenticeship around the same time they did, and I see them. They're now foremans. They're now superintendents. You may be wondering, like, hey, how come you're not doing that? Because hey, I don't want to do that, bro. I don't want to be a superintendent. I don't want to be a foreman. I would much rather more like focus on like my YouTube stuff and try to find that work work life balance with my family. Being a foreman, you have to be the first person on the job, the last person on the job. You have to work a lot of weekends. And so I right now, while my kids are so young, I don't really see the benefit of that, especially with, you know, I'm going to miss like soccer games, football games, just like those experiences that I can't really get back. And so I'm kind of leaving that for later on. Maybe my ideal goal is to start my own company, because I think if I'm going to really kill myself and bust my ass, I definitely want to do it for myself. I want to have like that opportunity to get like, exponential growth for myself so that's why my youtube channel that's why i don't do a lot of side work just because i already work enough i do work a lot of overtime on the weekends when you know the sports aren't in session and so i definitely think that if i was to work you know 14 hour days it'd be for myself i think be cool if you said let's build this in the game and then let's learn how to do the same thing with the kids would we'll be hyped i think yeah so I guess just integrating integrating the things properly so that, you know, it's not like just like really cheesy. I think it's definitely going to be big because, again, 
kids can definitely see like when someone's coming with an agenda. And so I think that, you know, there are certain YouTubers like, you know, Mark Robertson and some of those engineering guys that definitely do make learning fun. I think just find that balance, right? I don't think a lot of carpenters have a hard time uh, conveying like just how to do things, right? Like I've had classes where people are just like, look at the book and then do it. And it's like, well, if I had no background, like knowledge about this job at all, I would never want to learn from a book on how to do the trades. And so it really comes down to are people charismatic enough? Are people uh, able to communicate properly to, to be engaging? It's a skill to learn. I'm learning myself. I absolutely have a hard time talking in front of a camera. Um, being on these live streams is absolutely like a uh, nerve wracking for me, especially not having like a co-host. So I definitely think it's like a learned behavior. You have to teach yourself the same way you don't learn how to drive a car instantly. I think a lot of people have to start prepping themselves to be able to teach these kids, to be able to engage with these kids and show them what's going on. So I definitely think that it can't be like a short term investment to try to get like, you know, a couple of guys for a job and then abandon them. I remember being on a big, a huge zoom call and, um, a lady said that she had joined the elect electrical program because electricians used to come to her, her McDonald's every single day and order a coffee. And it's really, they were really polite. Right. And so that interaction over months was enough to spark her interest. Now, if those guys came to the job to her McDonald's and were being assholes, of course, that's going to skew her vision. She's never going to want to join. But if guys are being polite, they're holding themselves a certain way. I definitely think that we can change to, the way we are perceived as carpenters and the trades in general. For me, the biggest benefit of the trades is building competence. If you can do a trade skill well, those principles will translate to other things in life. True, Greg. And a lot, there are so many different jobs where you don't really see, like if you're making a big impact, like say if your job is just a lot of like, you know, white collar, typing emails, sending stuff in, advertisement, it's, it is kind of nebulous. You might see some figures, but especially if you're on a big crew, it's kind of you kind of get lost in the system. But if you're a carpenter and you build something, you don't build it adequately, it's going to show almost instantly. Is this plumb? Is this square? Is this level? Does this plane improperly? You're going to see if you did a good job or not. You're going to see if you pay attention or not every single day, and it constantly keeps challenging you. So, and it makes you see things too. You'd be surprised how many times you would see somebody building something. You already know, like, hey, that's going to be that's not going to be right. Like, how do you know? It's because he didn't follow this in this step. There's no way that he, it's going to be done properly. So, you know, just having that experience and building that competency is definitely going to be huge when it comes to trades. And I think maybe that's something it's kind of hard to explain for those who haven't done it. But, man, actually doing something with your hands and actually building something and seeing it all come together from a blueprint to having the meeting to actually doing it, I think is it's amazing. It's a, it's a great accomplishment. I think it's way better than completing any video game that I've ever built, like being a part of a huge building and then driving past it. I think it means a lot more than like, you know, beating a, a difficult video game on like the hardest mode, because that's something tangible that's there. Like over time, all those memories you've had of all that time you invested in like meaningless things. Like I'm not saying video games don't have their place, but stuff like entertainment like that, it's going to all be forgotten, but I think the things that are actually, when you're actually building something that's going to be tangible, it's going to last a long time. I think you have a lot more pride in it than these uh, superficial things, I think. Let's get back to this. It says, infrastructure labor shortage by the numbers. Over 40% of, of, of the current U.S. construction workforce is expected to retire over the next decade. That's 40%. So that leaves only 60% left over the next decade. This is important not only for the industry, but also if you're in a union, we we have to pay for those guys for their retirement. And so if we don't have guys coming in, then it's going to be more, it's going to take more of our wages to pay for their retirement. This is a Ponzi scheme. Retirement in general is a Ponzi scheme. Social security is a Ponzi scheme. You need more people to come in to pay for the people who are leaving. This is works with everything, not just unions, not just pensions. If we're talking about like retirement, we need more bodies to take the place of the bodies who left and also pay for their retirement. 
So knowing that it's in your best interest to get more guys involved, get more guys uh, and, uh, actively in the trades, because if not, your check is going to get smaller and smaller because you're going to pay for those guys' wages. But but then again, maybe not because your wages are definitely going to skyrocket because there's not any guys who can do your job. Just imagine if you're like an electrician, you're making four hundred thousand dollars because no one wants to do it, and uh, you're just you're just milking it. So I think. I don't know. I, I guess that is a weird situation where if you are in the trades, you want to see guys come in so you can help pay for the retirements, but also not so much that the wages are completely like flatlined or completely just like plummeted. So we'll, we'll see a balance. It says, uh, in addition, the current shortage of about 430,000 construction industry workers is fully expected to expand over the next two years. But looking at the bright side, looking at the bright side, non-residential construction firms added 20,800 employees in November, following a pickup of 36,000 the month prior. And while there has been an increase in workers, non-residential employees remain $209,000 below February 2020 level. As the sector has recovered, only 67% of the jobs uh, lost in the first month of the pandemic. Lost two, last two months in the p- pandemic. I think one two. Uh, I think one thing that's really difficult also is that that's not really spoken about. It's just the fact that you don't really have a lot of job security in the trades, especially for non-union guys and even union guys. Two period, like just getting fired, like having some like the pandemic come and you just losing your job. It kind of does uh, make people like more leery about joining the trades. It definitely does, you know, make people reconsider. Like, why would I join a trade where I could be laid off after working a job for two months, then I'm having to wait a month to find a new job? Then, So there is that aspect, too, that makes it more difficult. But I think that with the shortage we're having right now, you're not seeing that as much. I know that in 2008, I talked about that before in my, one of my videos, it's just like so many guys just got shellacked. I'm talking about, you know, they have a truck, they have a house. They have a family taken care of and it's losing your job and not being able to find a job anywhere for five, six, 12 months and them losing their house, them losing everything. I think that definitely made a lot of guys really, really jaded. And I think that's adequate. I mean, I think that makes sense. It's not like that happened to you, but I think the, the situation is not the same as it was before. And I think it's rare that, you know, we had the same catastrophe happen exactly the same way again. So I definitely think that we have to find a way to make things more secure, but also uh, still bringing that talent too, right? If 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 you're a young person that's in high school right now and you have the choice of becoming an engineer or becoming a construction worker, I think the scales are starting to turn a little bit, especially with like AI coming and those entry level jobs aren't becoming as plentiful. You're seeing a lot of layoffs in the tech industry. You're seeing a lot of uh, layoffs in social media, uh, just in, in, in tech period and construction pretty staying pretty solid. I think we definitely going to see a shift. So there is, like I said, there is no perfect solution to any of these, these, uh, problems. Every field has its, uh, trade-offs besides maybe like healthcare. Healthcare seems like it's like one of the most like secure jobs we're going to have period because people are constantly getting older. Uh, people constantly need to go to the doctor. So I think healthcare is probably one of the most secure jobs. So I don't know. So, and also, you know, with non-residential too, um, uh, when you shut everything down, things are kind of like a ball in motion. And when you have that screeching halt, it's hard to get that thing back to the momentum it had before. Uh, that momentum took years and years of investment, years and years of, you know, uh, people constantly coming to work and getting in a rhythm. When you stop that rhythm and now people are getting paid almost as much as they were getting paid working in the trades and they're sitting on their ass, I think it's very hard for them to want to come back. And so I think that definitely is a hangover. And I think that people are kind of losing, you know, that savings they built up. And now that unemployment is not as plentiful, we might see a shift back more to this, but then some people might just say like, Hey, listen, I did that for a long time. Uh, it was stressful. And now that I've seen a different way about this, I'm going to do a different field. So again, there, these are things that we have to grapple with in the trades moving forward. 
So it says uh, the IIJA addresses worker recruitment and retention base head on, specifically Section 25020 of the, uh, that's the Jobs Act, in the case of the Secretary of Transportation and Secretary of Energy and Labor are well are well as other heads of federal agencies must partner to determine how best to educate, retain, and recruit technical workers. The language of the bill focuses specifically on workers who are fundamentally to building are fundamental to building the country's intelligent transportation technologies, including installation, maintaining, manufacturing, operating, cybersecurity related to these technologies. I think that's one big thing too, especially when it comes to this is why a lot of the big companies win because you might have a job that's going to last four or five years. That's a lot more um, appealing to a guy than a guy that says like, listen, we have a job for you here for the next two months. And after that, we have no idea. Hopefully we'll keep you on. But we don't know. And that's like when you, if you're working for like Hoffman or Anderson, they're working on a big contract with Nike or Google, you definitely want to stay with them longer because that's just that job security. And so that is one thing that that is kind of hard when it comes to trades, working for a smaller outfit. If they can't keep you going, they're not going to keep good hands. And so I think we definitely have to find ways to keep the work going and also keeping guys who want to stay in the trades that want to participate, keep their livelihood, you know, consistent so that they're not, you know, wanting to leave to greener pastures on a more consistent, you know, uh, income range somewhere else. That's something that even, even the trades like carpenters, we had to trade, we had to change our pay scale just because nobody wanted to become a carpenter compared to becoming an electrician. Electricians are seen as like, the cream of the crop as far as like the trades that are widely accessible because they get paid the most, they work inside the most, they seem like they stay at a job site longer than maybe some uh, some trades. And it just seems more of like a lax job. Obviously, it's a lot more like brain power. It's a lot more like understanding uh, what you're dealing with. The chance of you dying can be higher when it comes to like electrocution. But I think that, you know, even with the trades, the carpenters, we had to find a balance of change our pay scale to make the scale a little bit closer, a little bit higher up. Before, when I first started, we only got paid 50% of what a journey made. And so when we only made like $37 and the starting wage was only 17 and electricians were starting at probably like 25, a $8 difference is going to be huge. People are not going to want to come to the carpenter. So we switched it now. We, we switched it up now that German do make around 45 but the starting wage is like 27 like 28 dollars now so it's a little bit closer it's about 60 percent now so it's a lot more like appealing and again there are only so many electrician jobs out there and so i think if you look at it like maybe i can't get into the creme de la creme of the trades but i can maybe i can get on like the second best thing which i think probably carpenters either probably the first best or the second best depending on what your preferences is Okay, so it says, um, simply putting help wanted signs out won't be enough to fulfill the workers shortage. Boosting wages and other benefits can feel re uh, recruitment, but it will take significant industry wide innovations as technology, technology revolutions help drive workers to seek these opportunities. Workers increasingly expect to be equipped with the right training, tools, resources to do their job effectively and efficiently. It is important to equip this workforce with technology that will deliver the results we need, sp uh, spend our dollar efficiently, and improve the lives of workers. Yeah, I think, too, like bridging that gap between those who have absolutely no knowledge and those who have all the knowledge with technology, I think might be big, like using, you know, YouTube videos, using AR technology, using like VR technology where guys can kind of be shown things like out in the field, opposed to constantly being told, I think it's going to be big. Um, one of the things that I've noticed that really is helpful is like just using your cell phone. This might sound super corny, but using your cell phone is to take, take pictures and then have guys like show you exactly what they want like on your phone with, with a picture opposed to trying to paint a picture with words, I think is definitely going to be something that's just overall a lot easier. And, you know, people don't want to go onto a, a career field or career track where they're kind of feel like they're blind. And I think when I first started, 
I had absolutely no idea what anything was. I had no idea about any terminology. Just pretty much like they said, hey, go get a job. And when you get a job, do what they say. And so for some people, that's like a, a non-starter. They're not gonna, they're not gonna take that ball and run with it. Me, on the other hand, I'm a little bit more of like a psychopath. I'll just, even if I don't know what I'm doing, I'm gonna at least try it. I'm gonna jump out there. And so I think that if we can make, you know, if we can let people see, maybe like you said, like in high school, like if we can show them with like VR or give them like a day in the life of, let them see what's going on and let them see that, like, listen, you're not gonna be sent out here without any training wheels. You're gonna be taught up, you're gonna be brought up, you're gonna be actually, you know, coached up as you come on here. You're not gonna be sent to the wolves. I think a lot of people might look at this job with a little bit more uh, curiosity. It says, uh, it also, it's also worth noting, let me see if I can do this. It's also worth noting that the emerging workforce is looking for improvements of quality of life. Research undertaken by Paychex and Future Workforce in November 21 revealed the full-time workers find well-being benefits to be a uh, key criterion when applying for new jobs. The perks probed in the study range from financial, mental, emotional, social, physical, and career well-being. In addition, it's fostering a positive workforce environment, which improving quality of life reaps significant uh, benefits. It helps sustain and retain employees, sustains a skilled workforce, preventing loss, and efficiently due to employees churn, reduce the cost of association of new hires. So how do we get there? One of the things that my company does um, is we have a meeting every month where we kind of like, they buy us lunch and we have conversations about like certain like safety topics or they might have certain topics just revolving around like the work culture and how we can improve that. And some people might look at that as like super uh, corny, like they don't want to do it. Like, you know, you don't want to have to have like their their lunch interrupted. They want to go smoke or whatever. But I do think it does it does give people an opportunity to kind of like communicate and also bring up things that kind of get lost in the motions, especially if you're working a job where it's constantly like, go, 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 go. Here's your task. No real time to really ask questions. No real time to really socialize. I think that's big. I think also it's also coming upon us as like just humans to want to say, hey, do you want to leave here and go get lunch? I think that's one thing that's big about my company is you'll see guys take that upon themselves. Like, hey, let's go to the bar and have a beer after work. And let's just talk about like what's going on with this. Or like talk about work, just having that communication outside of work, I think definitely fosters better communication and the job. So it's not just on the employer to make it more like um, hospitable for new recruits and new people to come into the trades. It's also come upon us. Like if you want the young people to come and be like receptive to you, like building that rapport is going to be huge. Like just like taking them, under, tucking, taking them under your wing and like talking to them after, you know, after work for you guys, everybody hops in the car and just leaves. A lot of guys treat the trades like they're mercenaries. Like they come in, they have a job, they do it, minimal talking and then leaving. It's like, okay, well, that's, that's cool. But if everybody does that, then it's going to be very hard for people to kind of break in and really feel like they can find a place in the trade. So I try to be more like inquisitive. I'm also kind of weird. I ask a lot of questions. I can see how people think. So I like to pick people's minds and probe them and see like what, what's going on. I also listen to like a ton of podcasts. I read a lot of books. I'm very, very curious. And so that lends, you know, a little bit better for me as far as like getting involved people and talking and kind of forcing yourself out of your comfort zone. That's something that I definitely am trying to do more and more often nowadays is like, hey, just because I am in this sector, that doesn't mean that I can't sharpen other skills because these things compound. Like if you are a good carpenter, but you're also competent with speaking people and you also can communicate things adequately with your words, then you can be more like adaptable. If your company goes out of business and you start your own company, you're going to be way more successful if you have more skills than just, hey, I can swing this hammer really good and read prints. But if you can't convey that to a potential uh, owner or if you can't say that if you can't convey your ideas or make a business plan for a bank to invest in you, there's no point. Right. You'll, you'll constantly stay at a place where you're only going to be, you know, doing something for somebody else. And so if these are your aspirations, it is good to, you know 
increase your your skill set, increase your 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 toolbox, not just you know the toolbox in the back of your truck. Okay, let me get back to these comments. I can't find any carpentry apprentices, and I cannot find any carpentry apprenticeships in Tallahassee, Florida. Shaking my head. This is what Greg said. Is Florida a union state? I definitely don't think they are. I definitely think that Florida is probably a right to work state, and you know, that is what it is. The people of that state vote that way. So I mean, a hey, these are the consequences. Right to work just means that you you cannot require somebody to join your union to pay the, pay dues. And so pretty much what it does is it allows your union to have a lot of uh, free riders and that'll pretty much destroy your union. If, if no one pays dues, that means you can't maintain uh, the spaces. You can't maintain like the events. You can't maintain the meetings and you can't be involved in, like the political processes easily because your money does go to fund some of those things too. So it just makes a lot makes a lot harder to actually, you know, perform your union duties, like to pay the, the staff, to pay the people who are recruiting, pay the people that are actually maintaining our union. You can't do that if, if people can just opt out of paying dues. That's kind of like opting out of paying taxes. If everybody could do it, everybody would do it, right? And so that's what right to work does. And so with Florida, I think that's definitely uh, what's happening right there too with, with the right to work is you're not, you're not seeing as much, um, you're not seeing as many people uh, joining the trades in Florida under unions because of that. I mean, maybe in some of the bigger cities, you might see more um, unions when it comes to, like federal work. Uh, but I definitely think they're definitely spare, uh, sparse. Same thing like Idaho with with us. Like Idaho is a right to work state, and there is a very small union presence there. You don't see as many guys in unions. So again, there are trade offs. If you live in a state that's more right to work, more like open up, more less regulations, you're definitely not going to see union, uh, you know, congregation there either. Okay, so Precious says, I'm a non-union residential carpenter apprentice. I get paid 18 starting. Six months later, I get a raise to 19 here in Vermont. And the state high tax is, is equated to 15, I recently found out. Yeah, um, I'm not sh I'm not sure uh, about how much what's the cost of living is in Vermont. I think, I think that seems kind of low, but I mean... It just kind of like what you're doing. Maybe you're doing a more residential stuff. And so residential doesn't pay as much as commercial anyway. So it might be kind of depending on what you want to do. But I know that even in Oregon right now, I think residential makes 80% of what a commercial does. So I'm thinking you'd still be making like 20, $22 an hour at least as a residential carpenter in a union. So again, it's kind of what you want to do. Says, yeah, my team teaches well and I've learned a lot and can work independently a lot for things I've had no awareness on before. Yeah. And I, I think that's, I think some people do definitely trade off like a better work environment. I asked a lot of guys, like, why do they stay non union when we live in a union dense state? And they say, you know, I like the company, I like the guys, I like the fact that I have a truck. Again, different strokes for different folks. I'm not here to tell you that if you're not working in the union that you're doing it the wrong way. We all have choices. You know, hey, it is what it is. I, I like working for my union. I like working uh, in my union. I like uh, the wages we make. The guys are also awesome. I haven't met a lot of assholes as far as like guys who I work with, maybe a couple, but for the most part, one time I really get into with guys, usually when it comes to subcontractors, guys who have no affiliation, guys who we have no rapport with, guys having bad days and don't know me from a a, a panic a, a pan of cane, you know what I mean? A can of paint? Yeah, that's what I'm going to say. Okay. It says, in my opinion, in a non-union state, your goal in the trade would be to get paid by the job instead of by the hour. That normally means a specific job like flooring. Yeah, and that's called like piecework. Like a lot of guys will do piecework. You know, they'll they'll rush, 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 try to get jobs finished as fast as possible, get paid as much as possible. Like I've seen like cabinet guys do that. Um, guys who do um, countertops. You know, th things that do take skills, but also they can do, you know, effectively because they have the machinery they need. So I definitely think that's true. Um, I've also seen guys who do like sheetrock and stuff for piecework. You can definitely bang out a lot of boards and get paid pretty good. So 
again, you know, there's going to be trade-offs. There's going to be things that you want to do. Like, you know, Hey, I like the politics of the state, but the wages are ass or I, I hate the politics of the state, but the wages are good. You know what I mean? You're definitely going to see that. It says Max Parrish, 29 through PNCI in Oregon, interviewed in two weeks for pile drivers. Can you explain what you've seen for pile drivers on your jobs that they perform? I'm going to be honest with you, Max. I have no idea what a pile driver does. I know that they do drive pile like for the foundations for like large scale buildings um, and spaces. I that's pretty much the I, I saw they're the first people there that they set the jobs up, whether it be like they might deal with like underwater welding. They might they're just there to drive pile into the earth so that when you have a foundation for a building, it can stand on that. I pretty much get there once you guys leave. So I don't have an extensive amount of knowledge of what pile bucks do. I know that it's like dirty work. I know that it's like outside and I know that it does take uh, some skill, but I don't know all the ins and outs of being a pile buck. So I'll be, I'll be lying to you if I tried to give you a full breakdown, but I definitely think it's good. I've heard guys talk about it and say they, they definitely love it. So, I mean, that being, that being, it, it, it is what it is. Greg said in most non-union states, there's no journeyman apprentices. You have to go up to a construction job and ask for a job. Yeah, I can see that. And I mean, even in my state where there is unions, like you still have to, you're going to find a lot more success asking for a job opposed to being given one. Now, I did call a company and did get my first job through phone call. So don't think that if you cannot find a job locally around you by walking that you're out of luck. You can make some phone calls, but it's just the trades still are kind of old school and people do want to look you in your eye and shake your hand and see if you are really about it or not. So I think with that being said, with that being said, you definitely have to uh, definitely put a lot of effort and time towards finding a job, like walking on the job sites. But I think you definitely come on the back end, make phone calls. It's not some like it, making phone calls are good because you can reach long distances. Like say you live in one side of the city, driving over there is a, is a big investment, especially if you don't know like how far the job site is. Sometimes you'll get a printout of where the jobs are and they may be done already. They may be already broke ground. They might have a solid crew. Sometimes calling can help, but I definitely think even if you call and guys kind of like, you know, shoo you away because they might have, you know, meetings they're going to, or they might be really busy. Definitely make sure you're showing up to job sites or cranes on them. I think that's the most important to find a job. What's considered a good max salary in carpentry? I think a lot of people uh, definitely, I've seen a lot of guys make $100,000. You know what I'm saying? Like you might work a little bit of overtime. I think I'm going to make around, I'm, I'll be completely transparent. I'll probably make around like 90, 94,000, 93,000. I think this year I worked a good amount of overtime, but not like back breaking like every single Saturday and a whole bunch of Sundays. And I also did, you know, go on vacation, you know, a couple times this year. So I didn't maximize all the money I could make this year. I think if I really tried to and put my mind towards it totally, I could have made a hundred thousand dollars this year, but I don't think that making 95,000 or make a hundred thousand is that much of a difference. So I didn't really push that much harder, but I think uh, a good salad for journeyman is definitely going to be around a hundred thousand dollars. And I think, again, as you see, as time goes on, we have negotiations, the wages are only going to increase. And so I think maybe you might see a hundred thousand dollars might be the flat line of just working 40 hours a week, maybe in the next like two or three years. And I think as time progresses, it's just going to go higher and higher, especially with the attitudes of the younger generation. Max said, you went to the PNCI, correct? How did you find a job after you became an apprentice? Well, I just said that, you know, um, I did my interview and then I got this sheet of paper and me and another apprentice made like 300 phone calls, like back to back, like calling, 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 calling. A lot didn't answer, a lot like wrong numbers. Uh, some were just like, hey, we don't have any work for you or just like dismiss me. And then uh, one company, which was a concrete company, uh, gave me a shot and said, Hey, show up here at this time. And I did. And they gave me a UA and then they, uh, 
sent me on my way for the first day because like you can't a lot of times a lot of companies just to make themselves like uh more safe they won't hire you that exact same day they'll give you a ua and if you pass the ua they'll send come have you come back you have your bags lunch pail ready ready to go right into it and so that's how it worked for me and uh yeah it was it was a, a nerve-wracking experience because i had no uh prior knowledge but i get, we made it happen so that's the end of the comments let's get back to the article it says a large part of attracting and retaining workers in the infrastructure sector will likely include repositioning firms and owners to digital forward looking quick on the move towards innovative business solutions and somewhat future proofing a tenant that is that is uh core to the mission i don't i don't really know how you make things like future proof i think that you can only just be a more adaptable i think that you trying to uh guess what's going to happen in the future i think is like a losing game like we didn't see like chat gpt coming and having such a big impact on us you know three years ago we heard about it like you know whispers about it but we didn't see like how much large scale impact it was going to have we haven't we didn't we didn't know that you know mid journey and, and those like uh the regenerative ai technology is going to come so fast so i think to think that you can you know feature proof yourself i think is somewhat like pretty arrogant but i do think there are ways that you can integrate the technologies going on right now and keep your eyes open to new technologies that can make you again more efficient uh more productive i think a lot of times just there's like small things that can make us as a trade as a field more productive if we're able to use more technology if so many so many guys weren't just so like um apprehensive about it like having enough sawzall blades having enough fasteners having like the tools you need when you need them opposed to making a guy just work what they got if you had like some kind of uh ai bot that could say listen you have this job from the past previous you know uh last six jobs each job required this these things let's ship these out off already and then let's add on more if you need it but just like having that that background knowledge is having a database i think is definitely going to be big because a lot of times you see so many companies just kind of run by the seat of their pants and then you have to go and have some guy run off and get something and then missing like a couple of things can really screw a job up i've seen guys where we miss kind of lumber and now we're at the, we have to go back and we're taking off fall protection uh off the walls that are no longer needed but just the fact that we have to use lumber that like wasn't dedicated for this job because you don't have enough i think it's like kind of embarrassing i've been sent home a couple times from uh not this company but from my previous company because we'd have enough nails right we built the formwork ran our nails and we're like two hours away from any any kind of uh a hardware store they're like well go home it's like damn you know that sucked or i've had jobs where we'll go to one job site we're not ready to go go to the next job site we're not ready to go go to the next job site we're not ready to go and then go like four job sites in one day like all that driving because miscommunication uh this wasn't done properly we don't have permits for this and so i think being able to utilize a ai uh type um secretary or see what can compile information i think is definitely going to be big to make it more attractive to uh people coming in and just making our lives as carpenters and tradesmen more easy one second Thank you, Greg. Oh, wow. Well, I wasn't sure how long I was going to stream, so I ended up killing my batteries. That's crazy. That's the second time I've done that before. So, all right. So it says 
Uh, innovation and new technologies will merge will help fill the infrastructure boom and create new job segments as the industry builds out this new workforce on the horizon are significant developments in analytics and IoT capabilities, supply chain communication, new design, engineering processes, cloud-based collaboration tools, and innovative materials, AI, augmented realities, uh, building analytics, and 3D printing can do so much more. I definitely do think that um, 3D printing and modular building, I think it's going to be big moving forward, especially if uh, costs become a lot more expensive. If labor becomes too expensive, I can definitely see companies trying to build more where like they're not building on the premises. And so they can kind of skirt like some of the rules and regulations. They can do things a lot faster and dirty and then just like deliver the stuff on the job site. So say you build like one floor for a building and have a crane drop it. Like they'll build that floor uh, at a warehouse and then they'll transport it to the job site, have a crane pick it up and then drop it on, you know, the each floor. So I definitely, I definitely could see that. The one thing about like modular work and, uh, 3D printing work that's difficult is that it's not proven. It doesn't have the same track record as some of the things that have been established for a long time. And so people are weary to invest in it. So I definitely think that's a big deal, especially when it comes to like housing. Uh, modular housing hasn't stood the test of time yet. And so it's harder to get comps on like what the value of your house is. So that's definitely something that's kind of keeping things kind of at bay right now. But if you could have like robots, like build houses, like build like walls and stuff and warehouses and just deliver the walls, the specs, like in packages at a job site and carpenters are just tying things together. I think that definitely can speed the process up a lot. But again, it just takes like that time to show that these things actually do work, that these things do hold up as well as, uh, conventionally built buildings so we're definitely going to see in the future so it says uh as you prepare for increased retirement the continued labor shortage and in industry should aim to make itself more attractive uh putting a bigger premium on education training innovation technology adoption will help attract and retain younger generations that'll be arming them with innovation innovative new tools to do their jobs Innovation, uh, innovative new tools have begun to emerge that will help fuel the infrastructure boom and create new job segments as the industry builds on this new infrastructure on the horizon are significant developments and analytics, supply chain communication. Did I read that? Yeah. So, yeah, I read that already. Uh, today's construction, like any capital intensive sector, finds itself needing to make new technological leaps. Making such a leap may not be possible for every public organized company, but as other sectors have proven, technological revolutions or evolutions can drive efficiencies and scale impact that can also uh, tackle labor retention and emerging challenges. And and I think too, like finding ways to just just be more efficient and finding ways to uh, work with um, cities and municipalities so that the constraints aren't so heavy on just the companies itself. I think sometimes you find that you work in a big city and it, they kind of treat like the the workers kind of like, you know, you're doing your job, but we don't really want you doing that job. You're kind of like a nuisance and people around you kind of view the same way. So if we could find ways to build stuff like off site, if we could find ways to um, have everything, have everything pretty much ready to go. And then once it gets brought to the job site, just hammering everything in and, you know, whether it be like adding clips or whatever it takes to, excuse me, adding clips wherever to make to make these things like actually structural i think it's definitely going to be huge especially with there's so many places that it's just really hard to even maneuver even really hard to get things into the job site itself so if we're able to do a lot of those processes off site and then just just deliver it i think it's definitely going to be huge it's much easier to build a, a segment of a building off site in a warehouse and then drop with the crane only being a nuisance really one day opposed to having to deliver lumber like 
five days straight and then having like the saws going off and having like, you know, working the long hours and the constant pounding, I definitely think we can find a balance and then using, you know, the technology we have right now. But again, while things are working, it's hard for people to want to switch things. You know what I'm saying? While things are continually going good, there's not really a cause to make people want to use new technologies. Like our hammer works. So you don't see us with changing the hammer up that much. Obviously there are, you know, the Martinez is or the stilettos, but they're not changing that much. You know what I'm saying? So I definitely think that the more we try to utilize the new technology and get more young people involved, I think the more successful we're going to be in the long term. Well, that is the live stream for today. Just trying to, you know, branch out a little more. I'm going to be doing a lot more of these in the future. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I appreciate you guys. I'll catch you guys in the next one. I'll schedule these more often so it won't be just so much of a pop-up in the future. So, again, I appreciate you guys. Catch you on the next one. Peace.